now, you know, Glenn's gone, who's going to get to sing? We've got another... And they had this idea to do the kind of electronic music, and uh, Martin had bought a synth. Uh, and, and Martin came and said, actually, I don't know if you can sing, but I've got a mate from school called Phil, and he's got a fantastic haircut. <laughs> so um, they got Phil in, and that was it. The rest of that is history. And that was Human League. And that was the Human League, yeah. And then I came, they, they were together for a, a, quite a while, two or three years, a couple of years, and uh, a couple of albums. And then that fell apart. And Martin, uh, I just happened, oddly enough, to be in Sheffield that weekend. That, that they'd had the meeting and uh, and I spoke to Martin and I said I'm here I'm going to, I've got to take pictures of Joe Jackson at Sheffield City Hall for the NME Santa meeting up for a beer in the pub around the back the Red Lion so we did and he was you know we had a few beers and he seemed a bit low and I said what's the matter are you alright and he told me that the league splitting up and so we talked about that and he said listen I was going to call you anyway do you fancy coming back to Sheffield and and um, you know starting a band you, me and Ian together. And I said, yeah, definitely. So that was it. I never even went to take photographs of Joe Jackson. I'm Did you not? No, that's it. I mean, I, I didn't. I must admit, I knew you from the from the eighties. I was around in the eighties. I didn't know that you, it, it was an offspring of the Human League, actually. And uh, ironically, Human League are playing the same weekend as you, on, uh, but not the same day as you on the on the uh, Rockingham uh, Flashback Festival. We won't won't met, won't talk about it. So, obviously, the evolution from. Um, yeah. Um, Human League. How did you get the name what, what, Heaven 17? Well, the name Heaven 17 came from um, the book and the film uh, A Clockwork Orange, which mm. was one of our favourites. I mean, I read the book first, actually, and then saw the film. Uh, didn't get to see it first time, so I was too young, and we kind of waited in the queue, and they wouldn't let me in. They got, some of my mates got in, but I didn't. But I saw it about two weeks later. <laughs> and uh, it's a scene in the film where Alex, the hero, he's in a he's in a record store, and he's looking with these two girls, and he's looking through, and they ask him what he's going to buy, and they say, "Hey, you know, are you going to buy the new Goggly Gog Oil, or are you going to buy the Heaven 17? And it's also on the chart on the side of the thing, and so we stole it from Anthony Burgess, really, that wrote the book. Yeah, because they, they, they on on the, in the film and on the on the thing, they, they were supposed to be number four in the charts with a song called Inside. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was. Yeah, I've seen the film as well. I wasn't overblown away with it, but that's that's my. I, I'm the same, about the same age as you, so I missed it the yeah. first time round as well. So it was a very, um, it was a very influential kind of. Oh yeah. Young film to go and see. You know, you had to kind of see it, didn't you? Really. Yeah. 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 But I must admit, I. Uh, it was a lot of hype, and uh, to me, it was a lot of hype and nothing. But never mind. Um, <laughs> I mean, your first album, Penthouse and Pavement. Was was a huge success as an album, but the singles uh, were sort of relatively yeah. struggled the charts. Well, and including yeah. uh, the the one song I do like is uh, "We Don't Need This Fascist Groove Tang," which um, well, God, that was God, our first ever the first single ever we wrote yeah. together actually. Really, and yeah. it's um, I mean it, it got well it well I don't know if it was banned. It was banned certainly by Mike Reed because he didn't like it, um, and it sort of it got you a lot of attention. But it, it, it's strange it didn't sell that well, did it? I mean... No, it didn't. Which was strange. It, it was fantastically, um, critically acclaimed. Mm. And, and it was, you know, that whole album actually was, and it stayed in the charts for, for about three years. Mm. It did really well, but but kind of chart-wise, it didn't do very much. It was, they, weren't, they weren't ready for it. I mean, certainly, Fascist Groove thing it stood the test of time. It still played a lot, and it still as relevant as it was then unfortunately but um you know so it's okay it's good it's okay it doesn't yeah it felt it felt right i was listening to it about half an hour ago and enjoyed it enjoyed every minute of it yeah it is it's a great track great great right they're re-releasing it for record store day like it's just exactly like the original 12 inch Wow, yeah, because it, it, what, what I find it, it, we, we, the, of these retro tours, which we'll talk about later, but it's also vinyls now back, and, and also I heard uh, cassette tapes are coming back. I saw something about that as well. I'm yeah. not quite, uh, I'm not quite sure. I believe that. But... No, I'm not sure because I haven't got a tape. Oh, I have actually still got a tape machine somewhere, but no, I, I haven't. Actually. I've still got a deck. I've still got the uh, the vinyl deck because I'm a, I'm an old man. I'm, I'm much, you know, 
sort of late 50s, middle 50s. We won't go too much how old I am. And um, <laughs> I, I still I still yearn after the vinyl. And, I, and, and obviously, I've got a lot of your stuff on vinyl. Now I've got it on digital as well. Have to, I've got a converter so I can convert vinyl into to digital files to use, which is quite handy for me. But I, I love the feel of vinyl, and I, I miss that very much. I think it's it's almost like a CD in digital. It's very soulless in many ways. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I got rid of all my, I sold all my vinyl a really long time ago. Just Did you? Just, just got too much, and it is, I, I don't like clutter, I don't like things. I, I live a very kind of Spartan, you know, it, it looks, it's funny, some, some people came to film here a while ago, a German TV company, and they came in and they went, oh, an amazing place, what a lovely apartment. We've got a lovely view on across the park, and he said, have you just moved in? Because there's like nothing on the walls, and it's totally bare. I went, no, I've been here about 13 years. <laughs> <laughs> oh. You like the minimalistic bit, do you? Yeah, so I got rid of everything, and it, including my record player. Oh, no! Um, but I've got a boy who's, he's just 13, he was 13 in February. Yeah. Christmas, he, he was pestering me, so I bought him yeah. a deck. Yeah. So it's kind of coming around again now. So yeah, because HMV... Suddenly, suddenly the house has started filling up with more vinyl again. <laughs> I've got a cupboard full. I, I've got a cupboard in my house... And I moved in the same house 25 years ago, and that was yeah. my cupboard. I filled it up with vinyl, and it's 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 fabulous. I go in there, take out what I need, play it, and then put it back. I'm very very sort of strange like that. But anyway, after I mean, the Heaven 17 got going, and then you you formed a sort of an offshoot uh, called uh, British Electric Foundation. Well, really, to be honest, it was because, that was company. the first thing. I mean, it was the second <laughs> release of stuff that came out. But when Martin and Ian formed Heaven 17 with me, they kind of had had enough of being just in a band. They wanted to do something different. So BEF really was a, almost signed as a record label within mm-hmm. a record label for Virgin. I mean, I know it sounds normal now, but it didn't used to be then. And Heaven 17 was going to be like the first, the first thing that BEF put out. But it's mm-hmm. just that Martin and Ian and I were such good friends. Heaven 17 just took over and it all beca- it became just the three of us. And, it, and mm. so it almost seemed like BF was the secondary thing. But yeah, you're right, BF came out second. Yeah, and it, I mean, you, you, I, we just talked about cassettes. The, the first album you did, if I'm correct, was a cassette only album. That's right, it came out called Music for Stowaways. And yeah. that, the reason it was called that was because the original name for Walkman's mm. cassette players was Stowaways. The first one that came out really? was called Stowaway. Really? Yeah, the very first Sony oh, one. It was called yeah. Sony Stowaway. So we, that's why we called it Music for Stowaways, because it was cassette only. Mm, that's, that's good. That's, uh, do you know, I hadn't tweaked about that. Exactly. I mean, and then, of yeah. course, the buggers changed the name to Walkmans <laughs> yeah, so, on the next iteration. So, so you have to change it to Music for Walkmans if you re-release it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, you've worked... I mean, on, on there you had uh, sort of... On the B, B, BEF, I'll get my teeth organised, you had some great acts working with you. Um, uh, people like Tina Turner, um, Paula Yates was on there, Billy McKenzie of um, The Associates, Hank Marvin, Paul Jones, Bernadette Nolan, and Gary Glitter, which we'll probably skip over that one. Um, I must I must ask you, um, you were involved in Tina Turner, sort of, uh, her renaissance, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, we, we, that, that, the story about Tina on BEF was, was she did Ball of Confusion first, and originally... Uh, it was, we'd done the deal and James Brown was going to do it. And wow. we were going to fly out uh, and, and record it in America. And pretty much the day that uh, Martin and Ian were going to fly out and record him, their management got in touch and, and just upped the amount of money that they wanted to such a ridiculous amount. Not only the amount of money, but the amount of points they wanted to earn from the album. Mm. Not just his track, the whole album. It just, it was just, we couldn't do it. So, we'd lost James Brown and everybody was really down and we're like, oh, no, we're all hanging down the record label, the Virgin. And um, and one of the guys, Jeremy LaSalle's there, he said, well, I know um, Roger Davis has just taken over, he's managing Tina Turner, would you be interested in maybe Tina? And we were like, wow, we love Tina Turner. You know, like River Deep Mountain High was a big, mm-hmm. big favourite song of all of us. So they contacted Tina and and then we were in a, we went to America. We met Tina. We went to her house in in the Hollywood Hills. You lucky man! That was quite funny. Three young lads from Sheffield knocking on the door. And <laughs> Tina Turner came to the door. It was like, wow! Um, it's got very excited. Uh, and and 
then, yeah, then she came over to England and recorded the track. She loved it. She really liked it. And then Roger contacted us a, 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 kind of six months later and said, look, we really enjoyed working with you. Would you like to work with Tina again? Maybe write some material with her. But we, we by that time, were in the middle of writing The Luxury Gap, our second album. And we said, look, we haven't got time. We'd love to do it, but we haven't got time to write because, you know, we're kind of doing this. But how about we just do another single? We do another cover version. And we did Let's Stay Together. Oh, yeah. We chose our green song, Let's Stay Together. She came over again. We recorded that. And and it was massive. It oh, was a no. massive hit. For a very long time, it was America's uh, biggest ever selling 12-inch, that track. Yeah. And, it, and, and, and you know, and she, and she just... Kind of then people got interested in her again, and she got better writers, and she started working, and 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 that's it. And she's huge where she should be right now. Oh, a lovely person. She, I, I tell you what, I am a huge fan. I've had the pleasure of uh, seeing her a few times once at Woburn, and I was at the last ever concert at Wembley, and I was fairly near the front, and. Um, I mean, the, the woman has stamina of, uh, I, I don't know, I mean, she's in her 70s now. And she still does two hours on stage when she performs. And, uh, Legend. Amazing. And, of course, that, the, that, that was on the Private Dancer album, which launched, relaunched her into the market. You know, re, re, yeah. re, launched her big time, which is great. But you, you've collaborated with quite a few other people. And one of the guys I've got some of the tracks from and, and I love listening to is Jimmy Ruffin. Now, how did you, how did you get to work with Jimmy Ruffin? Um... <laughs> Um, we'd we'd written we'd written a track. Uh, I can't remember how it came about, to be honest. But we'd written this track, and we were and it sounded kind of we were doing it deliberately, making it sound a little bit kind of you know silly and Motowny that that mm-hmm. vibe and solely, and and we were just oh, I imagine you know we sound so real. We put like guitar sound on, and mm. it's great to get a you know like a real. Singer, man. But I, I actually, my memory fails me. It doesn't normally, but I can't remember how we came to Jimmy Ruffin. Mm. But but we he did, and he came in and he did a spectacular job on the track. And I mean, and again, he loved working with us, so we did a couple of things with him. Yeah. Um, and and it, it, you know what? Can you say you get to meet these people that are just just. Heroes and stars, really. It's fantastic. Yeah, he, he, I mean, he's sadly no longer with us. I mean, you, the, the two tracks I've been listening, I, I've got, and I listen to is the foolish thing to do and my sensitivity, which are great, great tracks. And you would yeah. never believe that it was you necessarily singing with Jimmy, you know, or performing with Jimmy Ruffin. It's only because I know it is you. It's completely off the wall. It's completely different to any other Heaven Seventeen stuff, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. I mm-hmm. think that was it. It's, yeah, that I, I think foolish thing to do was the first one mm-hmm. that that. Um, that we wrote and it was it was just such a beautiful song but it wasn't very Heaven 17 and no, I think that, that was the idea of well maybe we should get someone else to sing it that's in that vein and oh. there is somewhere I believe a version of me singing the whole of that but I can't remember on what album that is is that well we won't look for that one anyway. what, one thing I find incredible the, your, your first live performance wasn't until 1986 and that was on uh-huh. the tube that's you, right, yeah. But, yeah, and I mean, so all that time you've been in the studio, we've been a studio band and had, few, you know, a, f- a few hits, um, and, and you'd never actually performed live. It was just, a, it was a conscious decision, because, you know, after kind of punk and really, which was, we kind of considered, it, it just, it didn't seem very modern. It didn't mm. see, it seemed a little old-fashioned, that live, you know, where you record an album and you went out live, and you toured it, and then you came back, you did another album, you went out, you toured it. It was, you know, we were four, Evan Sensing formed pretty much the year, the same year that MTV came out, and mm. there was this new, brand new thing called videos, where you made little films, and and that was, the, that seemed like a much more kind of modern way to present yourself, and mm. that's what, that's what we decided to do, and I think quite a few other bands yeah. Including Duran Duran, I think, in the early days, said that they were, you know, they were going to do less touring and, and MTV, you know. But obviously, they didn't, and it just took us a lot longer to get around to actually really seriously doing yeah. it. Yeah, but you, your first live concert tour, I couldn't believe, was only about nine years ago. That's right. Yeah, we just didn't do it. We always said we just next year, next year, we didn't do it, and we kind of always kept to it. And it was only when Vince Clark, Martin had done. Um, Martin Ware had been mm-hmm. recording an album called I Say, I Say, I Say for Erasure. 
mm-hmm. and they were going to tour it. They were going to do a big stadium tour of it. And Vince said to Martin, I don't suppose you'd fancy supporting us, which would be great, you know, M17 supporting us. And Martin went, well, you know, we don't really play live. And Vince was 